All right, welcome back to another episode with uh, Hangar Flying with Smokehouse Pilots, and I'm super excited today to dive into a topic that uh, a lot of us as pilots want to know more about, which is how do we help the, the, the community and the public with, it, with our passion? And so today we have Adam Brown with us, who is a pilot um, with the Patient Airlift Services, otherwise known as PALS who is going to help us understand more about what it is that they do and, uh, and what it is that he does um, within that organization. And so, Adam, thank you for joining us today on Smokehouse uh, Hangar Flying. Great to be here. Thank you for having awesome. me. So just to give us a quick uh, background, can you give us a, a, a brief introduction of yourself? So how'd you get into flying? What, what led you into the PAL system and kind of sure. go from there? Happy to. Yeah, so I've, uh, I've been flying for... Uh, almost 30 years. Uh, I was always a hobby pilot, so I had a had a career doing, you know, consulting and and you know, boring office work. But flying was always my my passion. Um, I was a I was a flight simulator weenie back in the uh, 90s, and my then fiance said, "Just go and take a flight lesson." So I did, and she's still my wife. And <laughs> but she may have she may have regretted that choice because yeah. I was I was sort of hooked from from day one. So I got my, my private pilot license and then later on my instrument rating, um, I bought a, into a partnership in a Skylane um, back in the, I think, late 90s, early 2000s. But I was still working. I was just able to only really only able to fly at weekends and would do sort of the thing that I think a lot of us do, which is the $100 hamburger, go for lunch, the occasional weekend somewhere, that sort of thing. Um, but after a few years of that, you've sort of been everywhere you can go out and back in a day within, you know, a, a couple of hundred mile radius. Um, and it, it was fine. I was sort of barely able to stay instrument current and would go up with safety pilots and that sort of thing. Then in uh, 2013, I had a, a six month break between jobs. And uh, that's when I, you know, I had heard about volunteer flying uh, and I discovered PALS and started flying for them. My uh, very first mission for them was taking um, a young couple and their six-week-old baby home. Uh, they had been in Boston at Boston Children's Hospital. Their newborn son had been born with a heart defect, and the amazing surgeons there had worked to save this little little boy. Um, and after six weeks, actually a longer period, because they'd been uh, uh, living in Boston during the last parts of her pregnancy to keep the, her and the baby safe, uh, we were finally taking them home. Um, and uh, the, I was hooked. Um, it was suddenly a real mission that really helped people. Um, we still have photos of that mission. Uh, uh, and, and a few years later, we got a, a picture of the little boy who was then three or four years old and happy and healthy and looked, looked terrific. So that was, that was kind of the, the first mission that, that got me started. Wow. And, uh, and I just started, you know, flying as, as many missions as, as time and money would allow. Uh, after that, I've now been at this for over 10 years. Um, most of my flying is for PAL Skyhope. Um, I was then invited to join the board and earlier this year became chairman of the board for, for PAL Skyhope. So I spent a lot of time with that organization. But for pilots listening around the, the country, there are dozens, if not hundreds of volunteer pilot organizations uh, there will be one in your area and they do all kinds of different missions and we can talk about that as well. So while I'm very passionate about obviously the organization that I work with the most, um, it, there are many others and, and many to fit different uh, preferences and missions and capabilities of aircraft and pilots. Sure. So first of all, that's a, that's impressive. And, um, you know, the six uh, week old baby, I mean, was that a stressful f mission for you since it was the first one? It was a bit, yeah. At, the, at that time, I almost didn't know what I was getting into. Um, the, the the baby as well had a he had a heart monitor, um, and and I could hear that even though you know it, I was flying a, a Cirrus at the time, it was you know quite noisy in the in the cabin. You could hear this thing beeping. Oh wow! <laughs> and, and as as uh, we hit a little bit of turbulence, and you could hear the beeps get a little bit closer together, which then got the parents oh, nervous. Oh jeez! <laughs> it was a it was a perfectly fine flight. Um, yeah. But it was all uh, it was quite. Yeah, sort of a heightened experience um, because they were nervous to be flying. It was my first time doing this, but uh, it concluded successfully. Wow, talk about uh, talk about changing lives, right, and making an impact. Um, that's amazing. You mentioned, um, 
I know you, you kind of ended there with sort of, you know, there's a lot of different organizations out there. Are you a member of the Air Care Alliance system? Is so the Air Care Alliance is kind of an, an umbrella organization mm-hmm. right. um, that uh, a lot of volunteer pilot organizations, so the term VPO, volunteer pilot organization, is yeah. sort of an umbrella term for all of these uh, types of groups. And the ACA, yes, I'm very familiar with, uh, that's kind of an, an umbrella coordinating organization uh, among uh, all of those groups. Okay. Okay. Got it. Got it. Um, yeah, I was at uh, an event not too long ago, and and they were there, you know, with a bunch of different organizations, right? And yep. so, um, that's and right. so that's that. So, this is great. I mean, look, I think one of the things that <clears throat> I was really excited to t- chat with you today about was because, you know, like you said, the hundred dollar hamburger is a great thing when you start flying, right? Because what are you going to do once you get your private? Or you know, it's like we got to do right. something, right? So, all of a sudden, we're burning holes in the sky, and we're going to go eat somewhere. And then as you get those hours of beyond, you know, you know, under your belt, whatever, you start to sit back and you say, what more can I do? And that's where maybe something like this comes into effect, like it did for yourself. Um, uh, and so then you can really layer in impact with passion. And so how do you think about those two things, impact with passion? Th- that's exactly right. Look, we're, we're pilots. Uh, those of us who are not professional pilots do it because we love flying. But you're exactly right. Once you've the hundred dollar hamburger is nice. The uh, taking your spouse or date out is nice. Um, but that sort of has a limited lifespan, I think. Um, so the ability to really use your skills uh, and the resources you have to help other people, uh, or in some cases help animals or help the environment. There are lots of other causes that you can support with volunteer flying. Mm-hmm. Um, really allows you to blend those two things together um, and it gives you a renewed purpose for flying. Uh, we have a number of, of, of our pilots at Pal Skyhoop who've said, you know, this is, this is now the why for me. This is the why I fly. Um, and uh, that's absolutely right. I think um, if, if I look at my flying over the past uh, 10 years, probably 80% of it now is doing volunteer, right. uh, really? doing volunteer uh, flying. Um, the rest is either, you know, proficiency, training, um, <clears throat> occasional family trips. We do do some of those, but most of it, uh, week in week out, is is volunteer flying for one organization or another. So that's amazing. Um, it's interesting. I was literally chatting with someone yesterday, and I said, um, they asked me how much time I spent flying my plane for business, right? And I said, honestly, not that. I mean, relatively speaking, not much. And they said, well, how much do you use it flying for? public benefit flying or you know these types of missions and i said you know what not enough and i think that that's something i really want to change in the next you know next year really reposition that so that it's more mission driven to really provide input or impact to those people Um, because frankly i don't know how you feel about this but aviation gives us so much and it's it's our uh, responsibility and duty to give back through it um is that is that i think think that's right i mean we're for those of us who have the means to fly for fun, we're already incredibly privileged and, and lucky uh, that we have those resources. Um, and so we're even luckier if we can then turn those resources to, to, to the good. Um, not only does it, one of the things I found is not only does it impact the individual lives of the, of the patients that we transport, um, and it does literally save lives. Uh, mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, so uh, uh, we hear stories about you know, a lot. A lot of our flying is bringing people who are in relatively isolated areas. You know, more than two hours drive away from a medical center where they can receive the treatment that they need, especially if it's very specialized treatment for for cancer. Let's say, uh, so we bring those people who might be an eight, ten, twelve hour drive away to locations like Boston or New York or Philadelphia where they can receive very, you know, the best the best treatment in the world uh, for the particular conditions that they have. And what we hear from people is if we weren't around to do this, they just literally would not be able to receive this treatment and they would not be here. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is, you know, this is literally saving their lives or extending their lives with quality. And that doesn't just affect them, this, that affects their families and it affects their communities. They're coming from smaller towns in isolated parts of the country um and uh and they have they have roots in those communities and them 
being able to to be there or not be there is a is a massive difference to the to the broader community, and we find that when we start to serve um, one of these communities, uh, I, as an example, we've recently been seeing more and more folks come from Eastport, Maine. So mm. Eastport is uh, it's it's a beautiful area. Oh my goodness, I hadn't been there before. It's right on the coast, way up at the Canadian border. Um, it is the easternmost airport in the United States. It's beautiful to go to just for the sake of that. Yeah. Um, but we really had not uh, ever served that that area and that airport. And we s- suddenly have started to see a, f- a flow of uh, people from that area that, that we're able to bring to treatment in Boston. And the whole community has come together um, in, uh, in, in appreciation of what we're able to do for these folks. So when, when our pilots arrive at Eastport, there are often fresh baked goods <laughs> waiting there for them. The local uh, airport manager, who's, who's a fantastic guy, has, has acquired a courtesy car for pilots to be able to go into town and buy a, buy a main lobster roll. Uh, nice. That, and none nice. of that really was there before. Um, but you start to see um, the, you know, the connections that you can build with those, with those communities. And it's a, it's a wonderful feeling. I think you're, I mean, you're, you're spot on in the sense that, you know, it's not just the flight. It's obviously a life, but it's the life that has exponential um, impact. Right. And so there's so much more exponential value that you're able to hopefully provide through, um, you know, that, that uh, passion of flight. So I think it's amazing. As another example as to why flying makes such a difference for these folks, we we see people who have young families at home and the ability to uh, get to treatment and back in a day makes an enormous difference if they don't need to find childcare, if they don't need to spend two or three nights right. in hotels on the road or in a high cost city where they're receiving treatment. Um, and it just means that the, uh, the whatever they have is already disruptive enough to their life and family. The the additional burden and hassle and stress of getting to that treatment is something that we can just help relieve. And that doesn't just help them, it helps their immediate families as well. Yeah, that's well said. What's the um what's the longest mission that you've flown? Um the longest mission I've flown. Um I've done a couple of flights uh well so I'm based in the Boston area. I think Tennessee, maybe. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, that yeah, sort of western Western Tennessee, Chicago once or twice, uh, South Carolina. That sort of that sort of range. Okay. Um, all depends, obviously, on the the equipment you have and the capabilities, and all right. of the organizations. Um, you know, we appreciate whatever people have, and so for folks who have slower or smaller aircraft, uh, we can split legs, uh, and yeah. so and and the our mission coordinators and our staff work very hard to find pilots to do multiple legs or to coordinate with organizations in other parts of the, parts of the country um, where you know pilots can just pick up and, and and fly patients in two or three two or three hops got it so I want to ask you a few more questions specifically about you know your experience and how you know what you feel and see and do mm-hmm. and then I kind of want to kind of break it into two different ways of the pilot side of it and then the passenger side of it, sure. right? And talk about both of those, if that's Great. okay. Of course. Um, this is a this is an interesting question and, and I don't know um, how this will go, but you know, as a pilot, we're always looking to make sure that we are safe and sound, you know, the I'm safe checklist, making sure that we're mentally capable of flying that flight with whatever it is, right? I'd imagine just out of curiosity that there's got to be a level of emotions that come into that type of flying because of what you may or may not see with a patient or something that's going on or there's something that's happening that you might not see every day um how do how do you if that's happened how is it that you kind of push through that and handle that and maintain that that discipline for the flight does that is that a fair question it does i think there are probably two ways to go with that one one is around you know, hearing hearing the stories, hearing the impact, seeing the um, the issues that some of our patients are facing um, is just ex- can be extremely moving. Um, the the and that actually that's a very to me anyway is a very positive effect because you it makes me very grateful that I have not ever touch wood so far had to deal with things like that, um, and the fact that we can help make a difference to them 
uh, is is just more motivating. We also hear uh, uh, from some of our patients for whom the flight is actually the thing they look forward to um, because it takes them out of their day to day. They appreciate, you know, they're in a they're in a GA aircraft, maybe sitting in the front seat with a wonderful view, uh, and that they wouldn't get if they were flying commercially, uh, and certainly wouldn't get if they were driving. Um, and and so the flight is actually they find it therapeutic. Now, not not all our patients do. We have some nervous flyers. But but mm-hmm. many many do, and especially the younger ones. You know, this is this is a, a wonderful experience for them that they they wouldn't always be able to get. The other part of your question, which I think is also really important, factors into the decision making that we make as pilots in terms of a risk assessment, because we try not to use the word, but the word often comes in of that this is a mission that we're flying, um, and that that word gets used a lot in in the public benefit flying world, and it's it's a it's a slightly insidious and maybe dangerous word. Um, because it could cause you to make a go decision because True. you know that it's important for somebody to get where they're going. And so we, as a, as a public, as a volunteer pilot, need to be quite disciplined in your decision-making process um, and not take undue risks or risks, you know, with, with weather or, um, you know, the particular airports that you're flying into or weight and balance or, you know, all of the usual risk assessment things that you would do. You, you do not want to short circuit that, um, you know, because of the importance of, of the person getting where they're going. There is usually some other way. Uh, and I think all, certainly PALS, Skyhope does this. I think all good VPOs do this. They tell patients, we will arrange a flight for you. It may need to get canceled because of whether you should have a backup. And often that backup is driving. Uh, it might be, uh, you know, just rescheduling uh, an appointment. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, the medical providers are extremely, uh, uh, extremely accommodating for, for, for that type of thing. You know, I never actually had thought about the word mission and how it can have that, uh, that insidious effect. Um, that's actually spot on. I never really, I was just thinking of it a little bit differently, but that makes a lot of sense because if you're, have that pressure on you to complete quote unquote a mission that can get dangerous. Like you said, that's right. Uh, that's right. And so, um, that's really well said. I'd like to kind of transition if we could to let's talk about the passenger side of it first. Sure. So, so someone, uh, is looking for this type of, uh, service, if you will, how is it that they go about this? Those at those patients that need this help and, and, and where do they begin? Yeah, so it's interesting. One of the biggest challenges we have as a volunteer pilot organization is is finding the patients and reaching out to the patients um, who could take advantage of, of, the, of the service, particularly in communities that we have not uh, really served before. <clears throat> when uh, I, I mentioned um, uh, Eastport as, as one example where we've seen some growth recently, somebody told me that when they, when they first heard about the service, they thought it was too good to be true. There had to be a catch, right? And these are, <laughs> yeah. uh, but as soon as somebody actually took one of our flights and no, no bill arrived, like nobody ever asked them to pay anything for this, which right. of course, which of course we don't. They started spreading the word, and, uh, and and people start to understand. No, this is a real thing. People will show up and help you get to get to where you need to go for for treatment. Um, so th- the first question is, how do people find out about these services? And they do it through a number of ways. Uh, they do Google searches, you know, medical transportation, those sorts of things. Um, we have outreach in local communities. We also work with um, the major hospitals, um, case workers and social workers, um, because when somebody comes in for a diagnosis and they're told this is the course of treatment, but you need to be here every two weeks for the next six months, mm-hmm. you know, they have the resources to help advise them on how they can actually travel to come for that uh, for that particular treatment. Um, and we do it. We and we do it through through word of mouth, through social media, Facebook, you know, those sorts sure. of those sorts of things. Um, but it it's uh, we all know in the VPO world that we are barely scratching the surface of the of the demand that's out there, and we we wish we could get the word out more broadly and effectively. And I'm glad we're here, hopefully, doing that today. Yes. Uh, um, so that's that's really great. Um, how many times? Do does it have you have you had a passenger uh, show up to the airport and it's their first time ever being at a small airport? Um, pretty regularly. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, for right. for most of the public, why would you go to a you know a small airport? Uh, well, that's the thing, right? And, yeah. and so I was thinking, I'm like, there's so many times where I would be you know speaking with a friend or or whoever, and they say, I didn't know there was an airport five minutes down the road, right? That's right. That's As right. you're thinking about it from a patient standpoint, all of a sudden they're coming to a place that they've never been, didn't even know was there, and all of a sudden getting into a small aircraft. It's got to be quite the, <laughs> quite the thrill uh, in uh, a sense. It is. And again, um, especially for some of our, our younger passengers, I, uh, a few years ago, uh, I took, a, I think, a nine-year-old girl and her dad uh, for a flight. Uh, for, for, she, was, she was receiving treatment, and it was her first time on any kind of plane. She'd never flown commercially. Is that never, right? That's right. And uh, we put her in the front seat, of course. And she turned to me as we were taking off and said, I want to taste a cloud. Oh. <laughs> that was gorgeous. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. That is so cool. I love that. So, um, so you, get to, you, you, you get to give people those experiences as well, which is uh, a lot of fun. <clears throat> you talk about purpose, right? I love it. Going back to purpose. So um, if we could maybe then start to transition into the pilot side of things, right? Mm -hmm. And so you obviously, you know, started a long time ago. And so someone is listening to this and has the minimum hours and all that good stuff that I know we'll get into. Yep. Um, how do they begin? Just, just reach out. Um, so I would say go, um, you know, start by looking for organizations uh, that are in your area, uh, in your region that seem to fit the, the mission that you want to do. So for, uh, you know, what PALS focuses on are patients for medical transportation and also veterans. We can talk about our veterans program as well, if we have a chance. Sure. Um, but there are, and there are organizations around the country that, that have similar missions. Uh, there are also organizations that do, that uh, do animals, pets. Uh, there are some that focus on endangered species. There are some that focus on environmental flying. There are some that mm -hmm. focus on uh, human trafficking, uh, helping people escape human trafficking. Um, uh, and so on. So there are lots of different, lots of organizations with lots of missions. So I would say start by, by looking for those. Uh, if you're anywhere up and down the East Coast, come look at Pal Sky Hope. We'll put a, a plug in for, for us, of course. Absolutely. Um, and um, th all of these organizations, if you go to their website, they will have uh, a piece of their website for a pilot sign up. And there's usually a fairly simple uh, form to fill out. Just tell us where you're based what hours you have, what kind of aircraft you fly. Um, you can own an aircraft, you could rent, you do need access to an aircraft, but you can either own, it doesn't matter if you rent it, that's that's also fine. Um, and, and then most organizations will need to see just copies of your pilot certificate, medical insurance, driver's license, those sorts of things. And it's very simple. It's specifically for Skyhope, so how, how many, what's the minimum hours for a pilot to have in, in the, um, the so, so we look we look for uh, 350 hours total. Okay. Um, does not all have to be PIC. Um, we do ask that you have at least 50 hours PIC in the make and model of aircraft that you're flying, and that you have 50 hours in the past 12 months and 12 hours in the past 90 days, or a couple of hours trading in the past couple of 90 days. And you need a private pilot rate, private pilot uh, mm -hmm. certificate, and an instrument rating. Um, okay. And most organizations have fairly similar uh, experience yeah. uh, requirements. Um, you know, we want people who have are not don't have a wet pilot, you know, a wet private certificate. They've been flying a, a little bit in the system. They have that instrument rating. Not all organizations, I believe that one or two of the organizations on the West Coast where they tend to have more reliable weather don't necessarily uh, require an instrument rating. But I, I may be wrong about that. So can can through this. Uh, Skyhope system, can we actually fly an IFR mission or does it have to be BFR only? Oh, no. Um, in fact, we, we actually ask that all missions are flown under a, a, flight, a flight plan, which usually okay, means good. an IFR flight plan. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, that's great. I mean, look, I think that um, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the point is sort of making sure that, you know, everybody's clearly understanding the plan. They definitely have the experience and qualifications for it, of course. Um, but that's the whole thing. It's like going back to the beginning of the conversation of saying, use those $100 hamburgers to get all of that so that then you can come do this. Right. right. That's right. That's right. So, there are a couple um, of other neat benefits you get as well. Um, so one is many organizations are, are, have uh, an FAA permission to use a, a specific call sign. Uh, so if you're oh, flying cool. a PALS Hope mission, you, you get a PALS Hope call sign, uh, which you can, so assuming you can dial it into your transponder with a flight ID. Uh, but there are there are other organizations that either Compassion Flight or Angel Flight or these sorts of things. So you get a cool call sign. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> another 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 really neat thing is um, some of our uh, because many of our missions go into busy cities. We're sometimes asked to fly into Class Bravo airports, uh, so you you can fly into Boston Logan uh, mm-hmm. and land and go to Signature, and you won't pay any fees. It's the one way you one way you can land at these because they, those organizations are good enough to waive all all landing and handling fees uh, if mm-hmm. you're doing one of these these missions, um, and that's a really neat experience as a GA pilot to uh, to fly into these busy Class Class Bravo airports and kind of um, work your way through the system. And the controllers are wonderful. They they know what these missions are about. Um, yeah. They fit you in with the traffic. They'll help you with the complicated taxi instructions. It, it's a it's a really neat experience if you haven't done that. You know, it's interesting you bring that up. We were flying home. We went to South Carolina, picked up forty seven cats, and we <laughs> flew them to Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And on the way up, we put in the remarks that we had you know these these rescues on board. And we got preferred routing through the whole entire system, all the way through New York, you know, all the way up. Yeah. Um, so you're right. I mean, you and I've experienced that. I mean, yeah. you, you don't really think of that, but it is a real thing. Can I, can I ask? Help people. Can I ask if you were meowing on God? <laughs> no, that was not. I did not do that. But everybody <laughs> in the back, those 47 did. <laughs> um, no, but uh, no, that's really good. So back to the um, the pilots themselves. So. 350 hours total time, instrument rating, all the good stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, you can rent an aircraft and still use that. And, of course, I would imagine you got to just make sure that require, insurance requirements are all good in there. Yep. And, then, and or your own aircraft. And so, specifically, the organization does not have any aircraft for a pilot to come use to do this type of mission. Th- that's correct. And, and this is where you start to – there are all kinds of things that you that we wish we could do but you then start to bump into what the FAA will allow or not allow. Correct. Yeah. Um, we operate, all of all of the VPOs operate under some uh, FAA waivers that allow mm-hmm. us to fly these missions part 91. So the, the pilots are not receiving any, any kind of compensation uh, for the, for the, the, uh, 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 for the operation. Um, there are in some cases an ability to get repaid some portion of the fuel costs. Certain organizations are able to do that. Um, that adds another layer of complexity, um, but those the organizations are not able to provide aircraft or provide any kind of sort of subsidized access to aircraft that would uh, that would violate what the FAA would allow. Got it. Yep. Just wanted to make sure that whoever's listening out there understands that um, because that is a that is a, yeah. obviously an important piece here. Um, I'd love to talk about the veterans program that you have. Sure. Um, what's going on there? So um, we have, and as long as the uh, organization's been in place, we've we've got a, uh, a sort of a branch of the organization called Pals for Patriots, um, and that is focused on uh, transporting injured and disabled veterans to either specialized military medical centers, uh, retreats, uh, and morale boosting events. So we've flown, uh, I think, since 2011, over 1,800 veterans and their families. Um, we fly them, for example, to camps like the wonderful Travis Mills Foundation in Augusta, Maine. Uh, Travis Mills was an army sergeant who is a quad amputee. Uh, he lost wow. all, all four of his limbs, either completely or partially. Wonderful guy. Um, hilarious speaker. If you, you might want to bring him on the program. He's just he's, he's, he's fantastic. Sure. And he runs this uh, amazing camp um, uh, for what they call Recalibrating Warriors. Uh, but they also work with EMTs and other folks who faced, uh, you know, just stressful situations and help them help them readapt both them and their and their families. We do something similar with the Camp Southern Ground in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and uh, we also, from time to time, will fly groups of veterans, uh, typically from Walter Reed and other places, to attend Major League Baseball games. Oh, that's uh, cool. So we'll fly them to the uh, wherever, you know, Pittsburgh or or somewhere like that, uh, and they, you know. They, they, they get the full treatment. They're on, they're on the field. Uh, they get great seats. They get to meet the team. Uh, they're up on the uh, uh, up on the on the boards there, um, and that's a that's a wonderful program as well. That just gets gets them out of what they're struggling with day to day, and they have a, a you know a great night out uh, courtesy of the uh, of the uh, major league major league baseball. <clears throat> that's amazing. I love the um, the focus on veterans. I mean, that's just awesome. Yeah. Um, I'm involved in another nonprofit called uh, Tribute Aviation, and that's exactly what we do is focus mm-hmm. specifically on veterans, and we put them back into a steerman, and uh, we take them on a steerman ride oh, wonderful. Uh, down here in the Virginia area. So it's pretty cool. That's great. So uh, 
I definitely can resonate with that. Um, is is there other ways to um, volunteer for this organization if you're not just a pilot? I mean, uh, how, how can you do that? Absolutely. So uh, lo- lots of different ways. Um, first of all, if you if you are a pilot, but you maybe don't have the aircraft access or you don't yet have the hours, mm-hmm. uh, you can sign up as a mission assistant. So you can come along, fly, typically right seat. That's cool. Um, and just kind of see how see how an operation goes, meet the passengers, help out with bags, help out, you know, help out with the flight. Um, and, you know, maybe get a little, uh, you know, a little uh, stick time along the way, if that's okay with the PIC. Um, outside of flying, uh, absolutely. So there is awareness building, um, just spreading the word in your community, spreading the word among, <clears throat> among pilots, if you know them, helping with fundraising. Uh, all, all of that good stuff. Uh, so there's there, there are lots of ways to to, uh, to be involved beyond just the the, the flying. I, I assume so, and I and I actually knew so. But I wanted to make sure that those that are listening, that are enthusiasts, or that are not yet to those hours, know that you can still create an impact, yeah. right? And so I think that's really and, and we really love. I, I can tell you as a as a command pilot, we love bringing mission assistants along, particularly if they're folks who have the potential to become pilots in the future. Right. Right. I would imagine so. And then also, I mean, just frankly, having help. I mean, I would imagine that's, right. that's probably a, a nice thing to have. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> do you all run outside of just, um, you know, doing these these missions and things like that and, and, and trips? Do you run different events throughout the year? We do. We have a number of uh, we have a number of uh, so sort of core fundraising events that, that we run. So there's a, an annual uh, gala in Westchester, New York. Um, we have a, a, an event in Boston most years. We had a, a lovely event on Long Island. Uh, you know, that, that's sort of where the organization has, has always been based, is in uh, New York, Boston kind of area. Um, we also sponsor a number of events, uh, including the New York Marathon. Uh, so we, we have runners who are running in the New York Marathon who uh, uh, raise money for Pal Sky Hope. Uh, and mm-hmm. we're looking at a couple of, I think we, we did the Marine Corps Marathon last year, and uh, we may be doing it again this year. Um, and then we also have reach out events uh, more for the pilot community. Uh, so regularly throughout the year within sort of our core geography, which tends to be Maine, New England sort of area, um, we'll run uh, kind of Sunday morning coffees or barbecues or lunches sure. or things like that for, uh, for the pilots and for the controllers who support us. Uh, so you get, to, you get to meet the controllers as well at many of those events. That's amazing. I, you know, I love that you just brought up the controllers because um, one of our um, uh, passions through Smokehouse is connecting with controllers mm-hmm. um, because, you know, they're part of the team, right? That's that's part of the system. They're helping us and, that's and right. keeping eyes on the sky. And so you can never forget about the controllers because they're just as important to this mission as, as the pilot. And so um, I appreciate that you guys do that. Um, we know what we ought to do at some point. I mean, I don't know how <clears throat> how this goes through the system, but... If there's ever ways that we can run an event down in the Virginia area and or, you know, more towards the D.C. area together, um, I'd be hoping, you know, I'd be open to doing something like that if, if that's a possibility. I don't know what that would look like, but absolutely uh, no, that out there to we, you. We, we'd love to do that. We, we're always looking for ways to kind of expand um, our, our geographic reach and, our, you know, our reach yeah. overall. So, yeah, we would, would love to do that's something like that. Talk, chat about that. Yeah. On the, on the, real quick on the pilot side, I, I didn't ask this question. I should have. You become qualified to fly. You are in your system, mm-hmm. and there's a, <clears throat> I'm, I guess, a, an alert system that comes up to say, "Hey, we have this mission. It's in your area. Do you want to take it?" How does that work? How does the pilot become aware of this, or are they actually going in looking for this stuff to find it, or is it being both. pushed to them? The answer is both. So we we have yeah. a, a system. You get a log into it, and it shows you all of the missions available. And on any given day, there may well be between 100 and 200 missions available stretching out over the coming months uh, because people are often know that they need to schedule treatment two, three, four months ahead. Um, So you can, uh, you can sort that list by things that are either going on near near your home base or going past your home base uh, by what we call mission efficiency. Um, And you can pick a mission and, and push a button and basically volunteer that yes, yes, I'll take this, this leg. Um, we also send out emails. So there are regular emails that go out that, that so, you know, here are the upcoming missions over the next few days. And then we have a, a dedicated team of three wonderful mission coordinators who are the, the face of the organization to both 
the pilots and the patients when it comes to actually scheduling, uh, actually scheduling missions. Um, and uh, as you know, if, if something is coming up, either there's an urgent need that has arisen or there's somebody who, who needs to go somewhere in the next couple of days, they will start actively working the phones and the emails and the texts to try to find somebody to help fill, uh, fill a leg that needs, that needs filling. <laughs> Uh, so um, you can, if you're somebody who likes to plan a few weeks out, which which I do, I like to log on and, and try and plan out, you know, what am I going to do yeah. in two or three weeks time? We have lots of other pilots that don't want to commit that far ahead. But when, <laughs> if somebody needs to go, you know, tomorrow morning, they're, they're there and they're willing to, uh, to drop what they're doing and go help out with that. Yeah, that's great. I mean, everybody has different schedules, right? So it's like, it's perfect. That's um, right. Well, how, I, I, I have so many questions, but I want to make sure that we're cognizant of time, but I... When you look at the patient sides of things, does the organization have a system or do you have a desire to kind of keep track of those patients that have gone through the system and, and where they're at today? I mean, is there a sort of like a flight following sort of concept at all? Well, you um, get to know these folks, um, you know, so it's not that we're not um, we're certainly not tracking their Sure. You know, their health, that would not be appropriate. Of course. Of but course. we do, we see them. Uh, we, we see mm -hmm. patients that will be, you know, we're flying them every two weeks for months on end. And so we can, we talk to them. We know, we know how they're doing. They're talking to our mission coordinators. They're telling us how they're doing. Um, and, you know, it's wonderful to see um, when somebody stops flying with us, it's either for a very good reason or not such a good reason. Um and uh, those good reasons are stories that we like to you know, share and celebrate. And, you know, <clears throat> we miss the folks that we don't fly anymore because, you know, that that didn't work sure. out for them. And I think the reason that I asked the question, it was more of the, the point, the <clears throat> what's happening is that you're building a relationships relationship with these people. It's not just a one and done. That's right. Maybe it is, but it seems like it's more of an ongoing relationship that you can build. It, it uh, can with, be. I mean, some, some people... Some people are coming once for a, a you know for a test or a diagnosis, that yep. may then develop into regular treatment, um, or, or you know, and then sometimes it's you know maybe just a checkup six months later and then and sure. then they're done, which is which is great to see. But yes, you do absolutely develop a relationship, um, and you develop you know because we fly a lot of young kids who develop relationships with their their parents, and they'll send us pictures of how you know somebody's oh, doing. Cool. So. Yeah. Uh, That's I think great. Of one little girl we flew for many years who had a neuroblastoma. The first time I flew her, she was, you know, I think one or two years old, no hair, um, with a, you know, pain, like a, a box that she had to carry around to manage her pain. It was, it was awful. Um, and I think we flew her for four or five years. And over the years, she started, you know, grew, got her hair back, got happy, was, you know, like to show us her ballerina moves. Um, and just turned into this beautiful, happy, you know, healthy little girl. Uh, and we got amazing. to kind of see that in a little time lapse as, uh, uh, as That's we flew amazing. Around. That's so great. So kind of coming full circle here, right? So remind me, you started flying um, with Skyhope in, in what year? Uh, I believe 2013. Okay. And to this day, you are now the chairman of the board. Is that correct? It is, yeah. And what does that feel like for you? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a responsibility, you know, um, it's such a wonderful organization. It was founded in, uh, 2010. So it's been going 14 years now. Um, the, the, the board prior to me, uh, and the, and the team have built the organization up to where we've, they've flown 31, over 31,000 flights, you know, 900 yeah. pilots, 250 pilots actively flying. We're, we're going to try and hit 3000 flights this year. Um, so it's a, it's a healthy, growing, dynamic, vibrant organization. So um, it's it's an honor to be asked to help um, participate in the growth and future of that uh, of, of Pal Skyhope, um, and also you know hopefully guide it to uh, even greater growth and, and success. Um, you know there are lots of ways to grow an organization. My my background as an entrepreneur and in finance and those sorts of things. That was my that was my career. Um, but this is all, this is all about the mission. You know, we have to remind ourselves, you know, we could, uh, we could take the organization a lot of different ways, um, and we could grow for growth's sake, but this, we're here to make an impact on the lives of the patients and the veterans that we serve. 
And so hopefully all of the all the decisions we make, whether that's about fundraising or how we recruit pilots or where we grow or how many missions we can fly, um, is all in the service of making sure we're taking care of uh, of the people we're trying to serve and the communities we're trying to serve. That's amazing. Well, I have to tell you, um, you all are uh, doing an amazing, amazing service and, and doing an amazing mission here. And so I, I really appreciate what you create in order for a lot of people to uh, to find value in and from, whether that's the pilots and or the patients. And frankly, those that aren't either, um, because you can still donate and, and, and contribute to this cause and mission. So keep up the good work. Any other any other last uh, words that you'd like to share with the audience as far as um, departing words that uh, words of wisdom from yourself? I would say if, if you're a pilot, if you have access to an aircraft buying or renting, just try one mission. Just just try one. That's it. It's not a big ask. Um, and I think you'll be hooked. Just try one. I like it. That's great. Adam, thank you so much for being on Hangar Flying with Smokehouse Pilots, and I hope uh, that we can collaborate sometime in the future with whether it's an event. Um, I got to tell you, I will certainly be signing up to become a pilot uh, uh, for this uh, service as well. Excellent, no doubt about it. I do fly a Cirrus, so hopefully that's okay. That's perfect. Um, okay, and uh, and so I just wanted to say thank you again for uh, joining us on uh, Hangar Flying with Smokehouse Pilots, and for those out there, uh, definitely check out Pal's uh, Skyhope. Um, the patient airlift services and i hope all of you have a great day thank you again